undergraduate at North Carolina State University and has been working this summer on, in the JCAP, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, on uh, materials for selective electrochemical reduction of CO2, something that we're all interested in recycling out of the atmosphere and into uh, uh, more useful forms. Terrific. Abby, we can when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Atwater. Um, like you said, this summer I was able to work on electrodes for carbon dioxide reduction um, in Professor Atwater's lab and, and with my mentor, Eowyn Lucas. So as all of you here know, the current levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere are staggering, and they continue to rise at alarming rates. And if they continue to rise um, you know, at this pace, there will be devastating environmental consequences. And so this was the primary motivation for my project this summer was how can we take carbon dioxide and turn it into something useful. So more specifically, uh, like Dr. Atwater mentioned, I worked with the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, or JCAP. And their entire mission is figuring out how to take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and turn it into renewable transportation fuels, so ethanol, for example. And here I highlighted scalable technology because that was really a driving force behind uh, my thought process for the summer and why I made a lot of the decisions that I did. And you, know, you guys are going to see kind of underlying themes of that throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, so for carbon dioxide reduction, it's a uh, tricky problem to solve because the bonds in carbon dioxide are very stable. So they're, they're hard to break using uh, typical uh, reaction methods. So instead what we decided to do uh, was use electrochemistry, so apply a voltage or a current to break those bonds and, and kickstart that chemical reaction instead. And so if you haven't seen electrochemistry since freshman year, um, the three main components, and or there, there are three basic components that you need in order to do an electrochemical reaction. So you need a surface, uh, so your, your electrode or your catalyst, uh, which is kind of where the reaction happens. You need your liquid electrolyte, which is the medium through which the ions are able to flow, so the medium that the reaction can happen in. And then you need something to react. So in this case, we've got carbon dioxide gas, and this flows in through the electrolyte, bubbles through the system, and reacts on the surface of our catalyst when we apply that voltage. And then these products go out the other side and into an instrument that tells us what products were made and how much. Uh, and my, my work this summer primarily focused on trying to, uh, trying to do material science to, to this catalyst um, to, to affect these reduced products that, that came out the other side. Um, so we decided to uh, use copper as our catalyst for a few reasons. One, because copper is inexpensive. So again, tying that back into JCAP's mission of creating um, a scalable technology. But two, copper is a really good electric catalyst. Um, because it can make up to 16 different products um, during carbon dioxide reduction, often three, four, five at a time. So here is a list of, uh, of just some of the products that, that copper can make during this reduction process. And it's also unique in the fact that it's the only metal that we know of that can make molecules that have two carbons in it. So if we want to take carbon dioxide and turn it directly into ethanol, so that, that renewable transportation fuel, copper turns out to be a really great option. Um, but however, if uh, you were observant, you noticed that I said three, four, five products at a time. And we uh, do not understand how this process happens. So if we make multiple products at a time, um, it, it takes energy, you have to put in energy to the system to separate those products out. And so that decreases um, the feasibility for scaling up this technology. Um, and to kind of give you an idea of the, the complicated process, uh, this was a review article um, that was published, and, and this kind of behemoth of a figure uh, shows a bunch, of, um, a bunch of different potential reaction mechanisms for carbon dioxide reduction. So to break it down a little bit here, you start with carbon dioxide. Um, all products on this side are C1 products, so products that only have one carbon in it, so um, formate, carbon monoxide, methane, things like that. Uh, and then each circle here is kind of the, the end path. And then on this side, you've got C2 products, so ethane, ethanol. Uh, you would only get this for copper, right? So uh, really all I wanted to communicate here was this is a really complicated process. And anything that we can get 
to, or any, any knowledge that we can get to get better insight as to how this reaction happens, um, gets us one step closer to creating a technology that, that can be scaled. Um, oh no, <laughs> well if you would ignore that massive yellow uh, box that I totally meant to take out of my slide, it's so funny. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so um, if you are involved in catalysis, you know that the um, structure of your material is actually just as important as your chemical composition. So you can have the same material, but if it, it will behave differently as a catalyst in bulk form versus thin film versus nanoparticles, etc. So we decided to induce a nanoporous structure onto our surface. So uh, if you ignore this giant, like I said, yellow box here, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to include these scanning electron microscopy images to give you a better idea of what a nanoporous structure looks like. So if you think about a sponge, right, that's porous, but our structure doesn't compress like a sponge does. And these pores and these feature sizes, so we call these ligaments here, those are on the order of tens of nanometers. So the scale bar for this image here is about uh, 300 nanometers, so pretty small. Um, but it turns out that this structure is actually really good for catalysis. And if we go kind of one, one step further, using a transmission electron microscope, which can get us much higher magnifications, we can get a really good idea of what the actual structure of this surface looks like. So if you pay attention to, to the um, outside here, you can see that the, the uh, edges of the surface are not straight and uniform. They're very rough. And so this tells us that the bonds, or the, the atoms that are on the surface, um, aren't bonded to lots of other atoms. So we call that having a low coordination number on the surface. And so it turns out that those low coordination number atoms are very happy to contribute to uh, catalysis and to reduction of, um, of carbon dioxide. So uh, this is um, really, really does contribute to being an effective electrocatalyst. So we make these structures uh, using a process called de-alloying, where we make a copper, so for this, uh, for this example, it's copper aluminum, so we make this alloy and then put it into an acid. And so the acid will preferentially etch or um, kind of eat away at the aluminum and it will pull it out of the structure and it will leave behind the copper and it will leave behind this, this nanoporous structure. And so uh, this is, this is the, the method in which we, we make these nanoporous copper films. Uh, ideally, uh, to kind of take a step back so you can guys can get, get an idea of this whole process, so we start by making the samples. To make that copper aluminum alloy that I mentioned earlier, we use an electron beam deposition system, uh, or a deposition method. And then we de-alloy that to make the nanoporous structure, like I mentioned uh, just before. And then we can characterize them using electron microscopy, so um, we can see if what we did make was actually nanoporous. And then we can throw that into our electrochemical cell and see what kind of products this, uh, this catalyst can make and determine the Faraday efficiency, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in a sec, or in a second, but this is kind of a quantitative measurement of, of what products work. <laughs> However, if you have talked to me at all this summer, you know that unfortunately, the electron beam deposition system that we used to make our films went down my first week that I was here and is currently still broken. So I wasn't even able to get to step one uh, using, using the methods that I thought I was gonna be able to use. And you know, although this kind of really threw a wrench in my plans this summer, it, it gave me an opportunity to practice creativity in a lab setting and thinking, okay, you know, how can I take uh, not even being able to get to step one, you know, how can I get around that? And uh, after many failed attempts at trying to make a nanoporous structure, uh, I eventually was successful and was able to use a purchased copper zinc alloy um, and de-alloy that. So, I was able to take this, this zinc, uh, copper zinc alloy that I bought online and de-alloy it from various times ranging from one to 16 hours, so leaving it in that acid. And here's uh, just some cool images that I took of a really neat structure on the surface. Uh, it's this like really cool dendritic structure. And you know, you take a first look at this and you say, oh no, looks like no nanoporosity here. But it turns out the nanoporous structure is actually hiding in these cracks here below the surface. So if you zoom in a little bit more, you'll see that I did in fact make an anaporous structure, which is really exciting. Um, and so I took this material that I had made and put it into our electrochemical cell um, and determined the Faraday efficiency and the current density. So when we do electrochemistry, um, this method specifically, we, we take our reaction and we leave it at one voltage. 
we measure the products that are made, and then we take it to another voltage, leave it there for a while, and, and so on and so forth. So here we did three different voltages, and these bars here represent, uh, the, the Faraday efficiency represents, uh, it's a quantitative measure of kind of where all of the electrons go, so it's, it's out of 100%. And so here you can see that there was some carbon monoxide that was made, which is bad for humans, but good for us, because it means that the, the copper catalyst did do a job, its job, and we also found trace amounts of methane, ethylene, and ethane. So uh, really exciting that we did see those, those C2 products that were forming with this material. Um, unfortunately, no ethanol, but you know, if, we can, if we can tailor the structure a little bit more, uh, maybe, maybe we'll get there. Uh, then here we've got the current density, um, which uh, basically tells you uh, how effective your catalyst is at, at moving current through the system. And so uh, as we increase the voltage, you know, we get increased current density, which is, which is expected. Um, and it should be noted here that uh, the rest of the Faraday efficiency here should be attributed to hydrogen generation. So uh, in, in our system, the electrolyte is primarily made of water, and a lot of times what will happen is the water in, in the electrolyte will actually be reduced to hydrogen instead of the carbon dioxide being reduced. And so that's you know, unfortunate, but a, a pretty typical and, and expected obstacle. And so we expect, or we suspect that that is because of leftover zinc in our alloy, which is known for, for being really good at hydrogen generation. So moving forward, we hope to try and, and leave that alloy in the acid for longer to see if we can really pull out more of that, more of that zinc to suppress the hydrogen uh, generation. And so I also threw this uh, material after into the microscope after I dealloyed it, and you can see that there is some uh, surface degradation. So uh, another big challenge is trying to figure out how to make a stable um, electric catalyst. So um, this, so this is the just before and after. Uh, so there is some stability issues, but you know that's again something to look at more in the future. And we thought um, since the material, the the nanoporous copper that I made was porous all the way through the material. What if instead of flowing the carbon dioxide gas in through the electrolyte, bubbling it through here, what if we bubble the carbon dioxide gas up through the electrode and um, reacted it this way? And so this setup is actually called the gas diffusion electrode. Um, and it's, it's beneficial for a number of reasons, but primarily because it allows us to react the carbon dioxide in a gas phase. So in this typical cell here, it's the carbon dioxide is reacting in a, in a dissolved phase. And so if it's, it's gaseous, there's just more carbon dioxide that's readily available to be reacted. And unfortunately, I don't have any results to share with you, but we are working very diligently. And um, you know, although they, there have been some significant roadblocks trying to figure out how to get this cell to work. It has been really cool figuring out, because uh, no one's made, made a cell like this before with this, uh, with this specific material. So figuring out those, those little problems with making an entirely new experiment has been really cool. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get that working. Um, and then next steps, like I said originally, just trying to get rid of that remaining zinc to suppress the hydrogen uh, generation, and we want to improve the gas diffusion electrode setup so that we can get reliable and repeatable results so that then we can take a bunch of data and see if we can correlate what the structure of our catalyst looks like to what products are made to see if we can get a better insight as to, you know, maybe there's some magic ligament size that really is really good at producing ethanol so that we can then tailor our catalyst to only make that one product and be able to scale it up. Um, again, fitting in with that, with that mission of JCAP. And kind of before, before I end here, I wanted to take a step back and, and share with you a, a piece of advice that I heard from Dr. Atwater actually. He said, you can plan experiments, but you cannot plan results. And so another thing that I learned this summer was you know, there will oftentimes be, be many unexpected roadblocks that, that come in your way, but uh, you know, while, while it has been difficult, it's been a good opportunity to practice perseverance and patience in a lab setting, and I've really been able to uh, think outside the box and practice creativity and adaptability, and um, I'm really excited to, to take those skills and hopefully bring them with me to grad school within, within the coming year. Um, so with that, I have so many people to thank, all of the people in this room, it's really great to see, <laughs> to see so, many, so many familiar faces. Uh, you know, first and foremost, Professor Atwater, thank you so much for bringing me into the lab, and you know, Eowyn and Alex for being just like the best mentors, and Matt for helping me with all my electron microscopy images. Um, and I'd like to give a special shout out to all of the KNI members here for for the Surf the Wave Fellowship because that allowed me to get all of those really cool images that you you saw on the screen earlier. 
Joe and Ian uh, for helping me with the electric chemistry, Emily for being a great <laughs> desk mate, uh, you know, and the rest of the A team and, and the other search students for just really making my summer this uh, a really, really amazing experience. So with that, uh, I will take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Were you able to characterize how much zinc went away in the, as a function of time or different parameters? Like how, how close are you to removing the, the zinc? Yeah, so um, I was able to, the 16 hour dealloy sample had about a four to three molar ratio of copper to zinc left. Um, the, the problem with that is if you leave it in the acid for too long, uh, the material is very brittle. And so if we, if we leave it in there for you know, more than about 24 hours, the whole thing will just decompose. So you know, while, while we were able to get mostly copper that was left, it's, it's going to be tricky trying to remove the rest of that zinc. Um, but yeah, so I, I did have a plot, an EDS plot. I decided not to show it because the SEM wasn't calibrated. And so the, the data points are a bit, a bit weird. So uh, in your electrochemically, you, you showed an image of the electrode after the electrochemical reduction experiments. Um, is that morphology one that indicates you had further dealloying occurring during the uh, electrochemical reduction? So um, that's actually a great point, um, and I didn't really think of that. So uh, maybe, but I would have to uh, I would have to look at it under um, under EDS to see um, to see if that was the case. But yeah, that's that's definitely something. Before this project, did you have experience in any of this t these techniques, or? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I did a previous internship where I was able to do a lot of electrochemistry, and um, you know, I, I came in with with microscopy experience, and so this was really cool because it was kind of a culmination of of everything that I've learned kind of throughout my four years at state, and it gave me an opportunity, like I, I kept saying, grad school practice, right? So right. you know, taking all those skills that I learned and really being able to drive the project forward. Any other questions for Abby? Very nice. Thank you, guys. Thank you.